project. This was done within the ATN. It was funded by the AARP, the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health. I wanted to acknowledge my collaborators and also special thanks to the Sleep Work Group and to the ATN leadership for making it possible for us to carry out this project. And basically, the reason we were interested in parent sleep education in ASD was um, while sleep problems have a lot of different causes in, in ASD, a major component is often behavioral response to behavioral treatment or both. And what I mean here is that children with autism are not immune to watching stimulating videos before bedtime or not having enough exercise during the day, you know, the same things that typically t uh, developing children might have. But then there also is a component that even if they have a biological or medical cause for their sleep problems, let's say anxiety, implementing a behavioral strategy such as a calming or soothing bedtime routine can make a big difference in improving um, their sleep, uh, um, even if there is a biological cause. And then another reason we feel sleep problems and behavioral approaches are really important is that medications for sleep may be less effective if the behavioral causes are not addressed. In addition, while sleep problems can be very overwhelming to a family, even treating the sleep problems has benefits beyond um, sleep itself. Child behavior during the day as well as family functioning can improve when you treat a sleep problem. So for all of these reasons, our insomnia practice pathway that our Autism uh, Treatment Network Sleep Committee put forth and published in pediatrics last year recommends providing sleep education to families as a first-line approach. The challenge is how to do this. What works? What doesn't work? Um, what can we do within the confines of a busy um, primary care practice? And that was where our study came in. We, we carried out a two-phase study uh, in uh, ASD, and the people we worked with were actually the parents, the parents of the children. We taught them how to teach their kids um, to sleep. So we looked at ages 2 to 10 years. Um, we documented sleep onset delay of 30 minutes or greater on three or more nights a week using actigraphy, which is a device that measures movement to estimate the sleep-wake cycle. This was pretty important. We made sure that the children had any coexisting medical conditions addressed prior to, to treatment. So if there was a GI concern or seizure concern, it was, it was looked at and addressed. And then we had two phases. Phase one in which 36 parents were given a pamphlet, literally just handed a pamphlet, not coached, not sat down with and explained, you know, just handed the pamphlet or no intervention. And then in phase two, 80 parents were randomized to a either group session or an individual session with a trained sleep educator. The group session was two two-hour sessions. The uh, individual was one one-hour session and there were two follow-up calls. Both phases were powered for, um, to make sure that we had sufficient samples so that if we did not find a difference in the arms, it would um, be OK, and we would still be able to make conclusions. Uh, and we met recruitment targets in both phases of the study. Um, and in the phase one, as well as in the phase two, we did actigraphy pre- and post-treatment. In phase two, we also looked at behavioral measures as well. These um, publications uh, reflect our work. Uh, Karen Atkins in pediatrics is about phase one, and Mallow and all and JAD is about phase two. And our uh, ATM sites participating are listed here. So what was our curriculum? The contents of the pamphlet and what was imparted to parents by the educator were very, very similar. We focused on daytime and evening habits, sleep needs, how much sleep does a child need, what, when is the best timing. We found sometimes that parents were putting kids to bed too early so that by delaying bedtime, we could promote sleep. Um, a calming bedtime routine, an individualized calming bedtime routine was uh, put together for each participant, and we made visual schedules 
uh, for the um, participants um, and basically teaching parents to teach their children to say goodnight to their iPad and other electronic devices. And we also discussed minimizing bedtime resistance and optimizing parent interactions with the child at bedtime and upon awakening. And just to emphasize, in the pamphlet, parents receive the content on all of these things. But in the formal education sessions, either individual or group, they were actually coached on these things and um, given some really one-on-one -on -one time. And here you can see some of the, the culprits, caffeine and the television. I'm going to just very briefly talk about some of the tools we used in our curriculum. Um, not all, but um, I will mention we used the FISH, or the Family Inventory of Sleep Habits, which we had developed at Vanderbilt as a way for the sleep educator to hone in on what specific issues the family was having, whether it be related to exercise or relaxing activities or caffeine. Um, we also spent a lot of time with parents discussing resistance and co-sleeping. We found that most Parents, actually all parents, were co-sleeping out of need, not out of choice. Um, either their child was not able to fall asleep without the parent in the room, or the child would come to them in the middle of the night um, and end up sleeping in their bed. So we talked about ways to help children fall asleep on their own. A lot of parents were not that excited about crying it out and other methods that they had read about, but they liked the um, method such as the rocking chair method, which is a form of graduated extinction where the parent could sit in a chair with the child in the room and gradually move the chair out of the room um, and couple those with morning stickers or having the child pick a um, reward from the basket of presents. Um, we also talked about the bedtime pass, which is a token system um, for minimizing bedtime resistance and night waking that was popularized by Fryman in the typically developing literature, and we wrote a social story. We modified these bedtime passes, which are basically three by five laminated cards that children could take to um, bed with them, and um, they would be personalized to the child's interests. And um, the child could either keep the pass or trade it in for a visit from their parents uh, during the night. And then in the morning, if they had kept the pass, and had not needed their parents to come and help them during the night, they would get a reward. And the concrete nature of them, the visual nature of them, and the sense of control that these kids had, parents shared with us that this was one of the most successful things they found in the curriculum. Um, the, all of the tools we used are on the ATN um, website. We have a toolkits website for a variety of tools within the ATN and ARP. And this is um, just one um, collection for sleep. In addition to our um, pamphlet, we also have tip sheets on bedtime passes, visual schedules, and even uh, sleep tips for children with autism who have limited verbal skills. And in the right-hand corner, you'll see that we're, we've, we're just about done finalizing a manual, which is the same manual we use in our individual sessions uh, for healthcare providers. And we're in the process of working with our um, ATM leadership to figure out the best way to roll this out. Uh, we hope to talk more about this on our call following the webinar. I wanted to briefly mention our results because they're exciting. I need to emphasize that these are pre- and post-treatment results. Um, and the graph is summarizing the results from our phase one and phase two. So as you remember, in phase one, we, we compared handing the uh, parent a pamphlet or doing no treatment. In phase two, we looked at um, individual and group ed uh, as imparted by an educator. And as you can see, for pre- and post-treatment, baseline and treatment, so blue and red, there was a statistically significant improvement in sleep latency as measured by actigraphy. Um, in the children who received, in the families who received either individual ed or group ed by the trained educator, we did not see that pre and post improvement in those receiving the pamphlet or no treatment. 
We also did not see an improvement, I'm sorry, we did not see a difference in individual versus group education. The results were comparable in the two groups. Um, we also saw, uh, we were very pleased to see that not only did sleep latency improve um, with treatment in the formal sleep education arms, but we saw improvements in um, children's sleep habits questionnaire, the repetitive behavior scale, subscales listed here, the child behavior checklist, pediatric quality of life scale, and parenting sense of competence. And this is, again, in our um, publications. So to summarize, sleep education works in children with ASD with formal education delivered in a group or individual setting in relatively few sessions with a pamphlet not effective. Um, and we want to go, you know, we want to see where do we go from here. Um, it seems like just giving parents the information in the pamphlet is not going to be as effective as um, actually giving them more coaching. But the question is, how do you give them that, that attention uh, in a busy practice? You know, what should be the role of the primary care provider in sleep education? You know, the pediatrician may not have the time to do it, but someone else in their office, such as a nurse, might. Uh, the primary care provider may be more, their role may be more, for example, focusing on what are the medical comorbidities that need to be addressed, are there any GI issues, are there any um, sleep issues like sleep apnea apart from insomnia, um, is epilepsy an issue. Um, how do we develop and test innovative models for delivering behavioral interventions, such as telemedicine, such as web-based programs? How do we bring these in, into remote community settings where they may not be able to get to the pediatrician? And can we think about doing webinar training on our sleep curriculum, for example, for primary care providers or primary care practices affiliated with ATN sites? How do we integrate behavioral and pharmacologic interventions? So for example, a child or family may not be able to do the behavioral intervention by themselves. But if they have melatonin on board, for example, it may calm the child to where they can implement a bedtime routine successfully. And then finally, we'd like to expand our work to adolescents and young adults. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and before we go on to Terry, I'll see if there are any specific questions. Beth, it doesn't look like we have any questions just yet. OK, so what we can do then is we can go on to Terry, my colleague Terry Katz. And uh, she is going to speak about um, different ways that we can conduct sleep education, both in this country as well as internationally. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you again for coming and joining this webinar. I'm going to be speaking about um, sleep education and programs that we've used to disseminate this in both Australia and the United States. And this was a presentation that Amanda Richdale and I um, co-presented at, at the sleep event that we had at IMFAR um, before formal IMFAR proceedings started. So we worked together on this. I wanted to mention that Dr. Richdale is a principal research fellow at the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Center at La Trobe University in Australia. And she's been interested in sleep problems found in autism spectrum disorders since she began her PhD in 1987. Her interest in sleep and autism and other developmental disorders is broad, and she's published widely in the area. And during our MPAR presentation, she spoke about her experiences in sleep education over the past couple of years. And I was very honored to work with her. So in going over some of the kinds of presentations that we gave and talked about, a number of different questions were raised that we thought would be helpful um, to discuss in framing our discussions today. And one is there is a need for the kinds of presentations that we're going to talk about. Who would be the audience um, for these? What are the goals of these types of presentations? What guidelines, if any, are needed? And how can we measure outcomes? So I do think these presentations may be another way to start presenting the kinds of information that Beth talked about in her presentation um, in terms of getting this kind of information out to a broad variety of people. So 
as Amanda and I talked together and compared what we did, there was, of course, a lot of similarity between our different types of presentations. But there was a wide range. So it, it went from webinars to full-day workshops, um, talks at conferences that weren't specifically about sleep, but might include um, either a breakout session on sleep or might feature that along with other issues that um, families or professionals dealing with children with autism spectrum disorders might encounter. We've lectured to um, graduate and postdoctoral um, students. Support groups have, have asked for us to be involved in their presentations. Um, Amanda has talked about the fact that the Australian Sleep Association has actually been promoting sleep education um, during this time that she's gotten involved since about um, 2010. And she was involved in co-presenting one-day workshops and actually just finished one in Perth in Western Australia. And these were organized in conjunction with the Australian Psychological Society. So there was a lot of support for doing these kind of presentations there. Um, there's also been material written on ASD, just like we have our website through um, the ATN and Autism Speaks. There are some um, called the Raising Children Network, Autism, and the Australian Occupational Therapists have also had material online. So there's clearly been a lot of interest in this. Um, people pay to come to these workshops. Oftentimes families don't need to pay, but sometimes they do. Um, professionals often have to pay to attend. And the target audience has also varied. Um, there's been similarities across um, the US and Australia, with one important difference, which is that Amanda has not had um, the opportunity to talk with physicians or um, medical practitioners. Um, they weren't precluded from coming. Um, and some of the sessions that she's offered have been widely marketed, um, but they haven't come to hers. And she thought maybe that was because she's a psychologist in Australia. Um, I, on the other hand, have had um, a number of medical professionals and healthcare providers attend and even had requests to speak with them about this. So that's been a difference. But aside from that, lots of similarity in terms of parents and teachers, students, all kinds of trainees. Psychologists, of course, are interested in hearing other psychologists talk, but occupational therapists as well. Um, and it's often a, a, a mixed group. Amanda has had one-day workshops just for psychologists. That hasn't been something that I've, I've dealt with. But again, the amount of time spent has varied from a half day to a full day doing that. And she just, again, returned from a workshop in Perth where there were 80 psychologists present um, that were mainly interested in um, learning about sleep. And many of them were people who worked in schools. And that's another component that I think we want to think about as we're considering ways to disseminate sleep education I think both of us have found that teachers and professionals working in the schools are very interested in providing good sleep education to their children and families. And I think we think about providing it to healthcare providers and to parents. But I've been um, very pleased by the attendance of people working in the schools and their interest and their feeling that it was very relevant um, to the work they do and their eagerness to try to convey that information to other families, to the families and children. So when we talk about what information we want to present in these um, presentations to community groups, teachers, students, psychologists, medical professionals, often it's a lot of the same information. And what we need to do is think about how to gear that toward a specific audience and also think about um, the amount of time we have to do this. As I mentioned, workshops can vary from a one-hour presentation to a full-day presentation. But within that, we want to cover a lot of the same kinds of information that Beth was actually talking about when we provide parent education. We want to give some information about sleep basics. We want to think about any medical considerations, especially anything that might be impacting sleep. We don't want families to miss that and only think about behavioral considerations. Um, to think about specific educational components, the kinds of information, again, that Beth mentioned in terms of amount of sleep, timing, what are the components of successful sleep, why bother, what's the impact of poor sleep on an individual, why do we need good sleep, and what are some good behavioral strategies that may work. Case examples are always eagerly um, accepted by, by participants. They're really interested in those. And again, thinking about what medications might be 
um, important too. I think for both Amanda and I, we're very careful about how we talk about that since neither of us are physicians or healthcare providers, but families certainly want to hear about whether that's an option and what role that plays in um, trying to help with their child's sleep. We'll also talk with parents about how to assess their child's sleep, sleep diaries, getting a functional assessment, kind of thinking through how do they decide if their child has a sleep problem or not. So this has been an incredibly rewarding experience. I think both um, Amanda and I shared a lot of stories about how um, helpful it seems to be for people who participate in these talks and how much we've enjoyed it. I really like doing this kind of work. You know, she does as well. There's always very strong audience participation. People are very interested in what they have, we have to say. They ask lots of questions. They offer some of their own case examples and um, have questions about their own children or just general questions. Um, regardless of the type of audience and, and who we're discussing with this and really how long the presentation, we get lots of good audience participation. And when participants fill out any surveys around their evaluation of the kinds of presentations and talks we do, they're overall very favorably received. People are very interested in this topic. They find it um, really fascinating in a lot of ways, the information that we provide, and very useful as well. And then we always, it's always nice to get requests for follow-up presentations, which happens routinely when we do this. So that's always another really good sign that what we're doing is, is perceived as being helpful and, and useful to families. And again, lots of direct feedback, both from families and professionals, that this is, this is really helpful. We need more of these kinds of presentations. I wish we could do more around that. Um, I think many people are really interested in kind of those you know, case studies, getting their hands on that. Um, and parents really want specific information. They're often interested in wanting you to solve their child's sleep issues which sort of gets us to our next area, which are the challenges around doing this. So it's rewarding. It's one of my favorite things to do. But, but there are some challenges. And one really is an ethical issue. And this gets back to those questions I asked really at the beginning in terms of what are our goals and what guidelines might we want to put in place for some of these kinds of talks. Um, because lots of families want very specific answers to very specific questions about um, what do we do about my child. So this is something we really need to think about. You know, there's, um, there's a need to try to answer people's questions and be helpful, but if you go too far in answering specific questions, that's not helpful for the rest of the audience, and plus you're, you're at risk of providing too much information without having enough background or the information you need to make a, a, a good case for what should happen next. Um, it's also challenging because for the most part we have a very mixed audience that we're presenting to mixed in terms of knowledge level, what they know about sleep, how they're going to use the information. You have both parents and professionals in the same um, presentation, so thinking about how you're going to gear that information to be useful to everyone in the room is important. Um, we often have a very short time frame to kind of pull all this together, so you need to think through, um, you know, what are the most important pieces of information that we want to present, which might get us back to some guidelines around that. And to balance the need for audience participation, there's a temptation, I think, to really lecture, because there's so much information to provide, but that's not usually a very helpful way for people to learn. But too much audience participation, and then you, you haven't covered the material you need to cover, and that's not helpful either. So how do you balance that? Um, we want to have even more literature to support our interventions, more is coming, and, and Beth just talked about some very important research that helps support this, but we certainly need more. And then to think through the follow-up, which I think gets to that last question um, raised, which is how do we measure outcomes? Because we really don't know anything about the long-term effectiveness of these workshops and seminars. They're fun to give, families enjoy them, we're giving, I think, helpful information, but it's really not clear what happens next for families and what is the follow-up around that. And I think that's a really important piece, clearly, if we're going to continue to do these kinds of presentations and use them as a way to um, disseminate this important information about sleep. So I am going to stop there and see if there are any questions. Yeah, Terry, we have one question, and I'm just sending this person their pin right now, so hopefully they can type it in and they can be unmuted. Sounds good. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? If you do, please type it in or raise your hand.
Okay, we have another question here. Um, All right, I'm sending you both your pins. If you could just type them in, that would be great so we can unmute. Okay. All right, it looks like they're not unmuting. Um, so maybe let's continue for now and um, Oh, Margo? Yes. Are you are you unmuted? Do you want to ask your question? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I had a question for Terry in that I'm I'm an occupational therapist and also have recently set up a sleep consulting practice and I'm wondering if you have run into sleep consultants who are working one on one with families in terms of disseminating information. Um, so we do that kind of thing as well. So I help um, run a sleep clinic here at Children's Hospital with Dr. Ann Reynolds. And so we do that kind of work, and I've worked with other people who have. Um, so I think that's a wonderful idea, and that's, I think we need more of that kind of thing, actually, to do with parents. And I want to say that I think a lot of good strategies around sleep come from OTs. So thanks for all the good work you do around that. Um, and I think collaboration around what different people are doing would be a wonderful thing to do. So like, I would love to talk more about what you're doing with sleep consultation with families, how that ties into some of the research we have and what we're doing as well. Um, so I think families would leave benefit from all of that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So I don't think that we have any more questions at this uh, point in the presentation, so let's move ahead. Okay, so I'll turn things over to um, my colleague, Dr. Kristen Saul. Kristen, we can't hear you if you're still muted. Yes, thank you, thank you. All right, Sorry so it's... That. it's uh, it's nice to welcome everyone, and I wanted to let you know um, that we're going to be talking about improving sleep outcomes through quality improvement, and some of the th it, um, some of the uh, adventures that we've been having with the Autism Speaks Autism Treatment Network, as well as the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health. Okay, so first, just as a, a brief overview, the the Autism Speaks Autism Treatment Network. Um, has a vision of improving health and quality of life for individuals with autism. Um, we try to do this through a sustainable system of care um, based on evidence and building evidence to make sure that children are cared for in a comprehensive fashion and really focusing on whole care for the whole child. So these are the sites that our participants in the Autism Speaks Autism Treatment Network. Um, we have ourselves uh, at the University of Missouri Thompson Center started there in the middle of the United States. Just to give you a perspective, as you can see, we have uh, groups all across the nation and in North, um, I'm sorry, in, in Canada, working together on this venture. The Autism um, Treatment Network Care Model really focuses on combining um, community, family, and self-management support, delivery system design, decision support, and clinical information systems together, and trying to activate and inform families and patients so that we can develop fruitful outcomes um, for families and children. When we think about sleep and how we're applying this to insomnia for kids with autism, um, I'm going to walk you through some of the quality improvement techniques that we've done to try to prove, and not so much prove, but try to show um, the best process for how this could work. So Beth and Terry um, have done some incredible work on how to help families, how to educate families, what strategies to use for, for children with autism and improve their sleep. And so part of what we're doing with the um, stream work through the Autism Treatment Network is really trying to incorporate um, the information that they've built and then try to make sure that that's something that can be delivered to families. And when it can be delivered, how can it be delivered in the best, um, most comprehensive fashion. So um, this is called the Autism Treatment Sleep, uh, sleep Stream Work. And so we have seven teams on the sleep stream. 
of the Insomnia Stream. We have Missouri, Toronto, Alberta, Vanderbilt, Pittsburgh, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Mass General Lurie Center. Our mission is really to identify families with sleep concerns, work with families to achieve improvement, and I apologize if that keeps coming up, I don't know how to fix it. Um, work with families to in achieve improvement um, in sleep metrics based on family goals. We ask families what ask families really what's important to them. Is it trying to have their child fall asleep um, in a convenient way is it, or in a you know timely fashion? Is it to have the child sleep all night? Is it to have the child sleep in their own bed, um, et cetera? And so we really try to develop metrics and gather information based on the family's goals. Then we test changes to affect outcomes and establish a process, um, all the while that we're trying to really develop a system that, be, that can be transferred to any type of professional that takes care of children with autism. So I wanted to give you a framework of where we are, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about the specifics of the Thompson Center. So this is the Thompson Center. We're in Columbia, Missouri, which, as you saw, is smack dab in the middle of the country. This is our sleep stream. And, um, all of our wonderful families, um, we have parents and PCPs and teachers and very, very dedicated staff here at the Thompson Center um, who are working hard on the sleep stream. And um, I'm going to talk to you about kind of how that fits into what we do here at the Thompson Center and how we're incorporating the tools that Beth and Terry have created um, to make sure that we're connecting with families and connecting with our community to have that impact um, that is so important to our families. So at the Townsend Center, we have a model of whole care for the whole family um, that's really revolving around family-centered care. So everything from our diagnosis to our follow-up, um, we want families to have the best coordination of care and decision support along, the, along that journey. So what we did, we knew that sleep was a big concern for our families with um, children with autism. So we had um, Terry Katz come in and do one of the workshops, the workshops that she actually mentioned um, in the, her previous segment. Um, and had a very excellent opportunity to have hands-on um, experiences with, with Terry um, based on some of the um, tools that she and Beth have developed. So it was a two-day workshop, and uh, sorry, two-day workshop with leading sleep expert, which is Dr. Katz. Um, we had a full day of that workshop for just our autism specialists, mostly physicians and psychologists, and then also staff as well. Um, and then we had a two-hour workshop for allied health professionals, students, and primary care providers. It was a really excellent opportunity to not only delve deeper into the tools, but also um, bring in some community providers in order to build capacity um, for sleep and understanding sleep. Okay, so what we're doing with the sleep stream, and something I wanted to kind of break down for everybody, is something that we are hopeful um, and are seeing progress with. So it's kind of the four A's, so asking, assessing, addressing, and then adjusting as we relate issues related to sleep. So what we've found is that it's not standard practice to always ask about sleep when you're taking care of a child with autism. So whether that be at a primary care physician's office or even at a subspecialist office, um, sometimes the first step is just simply asking. So asking about bedtime resistance, um, uh, snoring, nighttime awakening, bedtime concerns, et cetera. Um, so once you've asked and kind of built a system around how do we ask about sleep, then the, the fun begins as far as how do we assess. And so the good news is Dr. Katz and Dr. Malo have built some of that into their, um, their toolkit as well. So we know that we have to kind of see what the patterns are how, so we can help the family. The family sets, uh, you know, has an idea of what they would like to see improved, um, but really what is that sleep looking like? So things that we've used to assess um, sleep, especially on the sleep stream, sleep logs, um, kind of environmental factors, which the fish, which Dr. Malo mentioned in her first talk, um, is a useful tool for that. Bedtime associations, you know, are they falling asleep with the iPad, which these little pictures showcase, um, you know, in today's age of technology, um, many of our kids have lots of technological um, things around them. And that light that is emitted from those, um, those lovely technologies can often affect sleep patterns. And then also assessing medical comorbidity. So once that piece is done, what we're working on is how do we address those? Um, and so there's the bedtime routine workshop, um, again, little fun books and stories, social stories, et cetera. Um, looking at parental patterns, as we've also learned through the stream work, has been pretty critical to having successful outcomes of sleep. Um, and then adjusting. So what we're finding, and this may be help, helpful, helpful for some on the call, um, is that as we gather information or data, so to speak, on these families, we're able to actually reflect on what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis or on a week-to-week -week basis and help to adjust. So we may try something. We may recommend let's 
you know, let's take a break from the iPad, you know, 30 minutes before bed and see if that makes a difference. Or in some cases, let's try melatonin at a certain dose or whatever. Um, but being able to adjust and have a team of people dedicated to helping um, children with sleep has been something that the sleep stream's um, been having some nice progress with. So one of the things that we have designed, especially here at the Thompson Center and several of our other sleep team sites have also done, um, is really nailing down how we invite people to be part of um, making, or being part of how to help their child sleep better. So it's not so much about being part of a sleep team or being part of a sleep project, but how do we help families recognize the importance of good sleep hygiene, the importance of good sleep, and then also engage them in uh, trying to adjust sleep patterns. So one of the things we do here, um, our team has designed an excellent uh, kind of packet, an inter introduction packet, where it welcomes them to our sleep team. Um, we use the, the uh, Vanderbilt bedtime routine worksheets, a sleep log, parent concerns and parent goals, um, ATN sleep quick tips, and as you heard Dr. Mallow and um, Dr. Katz talk about, we know that those in and of themselves aren't always the most effective tools, but we did want a systematic way to get these into the hands of, of families. So currently what we're doing is the Thompson Center team, which consists of myself, um, I'm a pediatrician, um, a psychologist, a social worker, several nurses, um, and a mom and some other very highly skilled individuals. We, we review um, the information that the family shared with us, and then we try to kind of get our foot um, in a tier, so to speak, where you know we look at these kiddos and we've seen that they kind of fall out into several different categories, whether it be sleep hygiene, um, so bedtime onset kind of issues, whether it be nighttime awakenings, um, early, early morning awakenings, different things like that, or whether it be more strictly medical, they have significant um, obstructive sleep apnea, et cetera. Um, so what we've developed through the sleep stream is a way to kind of package those kiddos, um, a way to look at different children with different types of sleep issues, and then start to test changes that map onto what the family is the most interested in and in trying to look at. Um, we have family collect data um, with uh, each test of change that we do, which is a quality improvement um, kind of terminology there. The Thompson Center uses Google Drive. It's accessible from anywhere by any, you know, anyone with the, with the access to that particular drive. There's no identified information, no kind of uh, personal data on there as far as names or identifying information. And that's been working out fairly well for us. The results, um, you know, again, we've had, we had, we've had seven sites working on this. If sleep is challenging, as I know each of you on the phone recognizes. Um, sleep is improving. It is a, um, it's been an interesting and fun process as we work with each family and are, are looking to spreading that. So we started with N equals one, uh, which is just one family, one child per site, and really intensely worked with them to try to help things um, and show some improvement. And now we've kind of moved to what I like to consider kind of N equals most after we had N equals five. Sorry, I skipped that part. Um, but N equals most, where what is our system for our systematically assessing sleep concerns, asking about them, um, and then how are we going to start helping these families actually adjust their home environment or this child's home environment and sleep patterns to make an improvement in sleep. One of the things we're definitely finding is that connecting with primary care is crucial. Um, and so one of the ways that we here at the Thompson Center have addressed that is by actually engaging primary care providers early in the process. So what I wanted to showcase um, in our last few minutes together, um, this is how we do some of this work here. Um, so the Thompson Center has a concept called the pre-care model, which essentially connects the family as soon as they're on the wait list. Um, the, the moment they call our center, um, you know, we start taking care of that family. And what we found is this can be a useful strategy uh, for addressing sleep concerns and also connecting them back to primary care physicians. Um, so the primary role of our um, excellent team who does pre-care um, is connecting families with care coordination, resources, and identifying concerns. So this is where um, concerns with sleep are, are asked about, and if identified, then we have a, a um, system to get them connected back with their primary care provider. Part of what this model also does is empower families by engaging them, helping them gather data, and providing tools about sleep and or other um, medical comorbidities while they're waiting. Because I know many of us at autism centers have long wait lists, and so this can be a, an answer to some of those families' questions rather than kind of waiting for that uh, official diagnostic appointment. And so what we're seeing is that even during that stage, we're able to test some changes. We can access professionals like primary care providers who have a very vested interest in their families, because most of them have referred them to autism centers. 
Um, and this is also really improving satisfaction of families while they're waiting. So one of the kind of showcase what we're doing with the stream work and also what we're doing here at the Thompson Center. Um, I would really like to thank our team um, here at the Thompson Center, but also all seven of the teams that have been working so hard on the sleep stream. Uh, we're making a lot of progress on a very important topic, um, and I think together we'll soon start to see a pattern and a process evolve um, that can be really useful in addressing sleep concerns across the spectrum. At this point, I can take some questions about my specific um, portion, or we can move on to general questions. And yeah, let's put that up. Perfect. All right, so if you have any questions, please do raise your hand and we have a hand raised. Um, Margo, go ahead. Hi, Margo again. Um, I just had a question about the, the process that you've described and, and the, the sleep stream participants. Is everybody using a similar model in terms of, of I guess, I guess the, the stages that you go through in terms of connecting with families and providing support? That's a great question. Um, so every site's different, and that's one of the challenges that we've found kind of working on the sleep stream. So every site is different. And what we're working on are trying to find commonalities and how we can ask families to be a participant um, in the sleep uh, stream. But in reality, what we've actually started to really realize is that it's not a whole lot different than how we approach other, you know, for example, I usually use the, the analogy to ADHD. You know, I have every family fill out some type of scale to assess that child's, you know, ADHD symptoms, for example. Um, and so what we're really working on and kind of a shift in focus that we're doing with the sleep stream is how can we parallel things that we do already? So for example, rather than saying to the family, oh, we need you to participate in this big project, how can we engage them um, in just the normal pattern of how we would assess any other thing? So that has been very useful as other sites with lots of different processes um, are starting to come together around the concept of how can we just how can this just be part of what we do and not necessarily a giant new process. So to answer your specific question, um, every site is a little different. We know that. Uh, we also know there's going to be variability among providers and number of team providers. So not every place may have a you know care coordination center like we do. Um, and so we're working within the confines of what we have um, and how and then learning from each other. That's been the neatest piece of the process is that the learning collaborative has actually been able to really learn and tweak from each other um, how we can you know move this concept forward. Did that answer your question enough? Yes, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? If you could please raise your hand. I, think I don't have anything. Well, just a wonderful presentation by our three presenters today. This is Dan. Um, I was wondering, um, in terms of ramping up to more people, are there any particular ideas that uh, Beth or Kristen or Terry might have? And how do you think that might vary from community to community? Ramping up this educational process. Um, well, this is Terry. Can you guys hear me? Am I on? Yes, I hear you. I lost you. <laughs> okay. So I think it is going to vary from community to community, and I think it's, it's going to be kind of an ongoing process to figure out the best way to do this. Um, you know, I think an individual approach is going to, obviously, we'll see fewer people, but I think we'll be able to solve more problems, probably in a more effective way, but in thinking about it more efficiently, moving to groups and thinking about how many people we can have in a group where we can discuss this would be another way to do this. And then really to start reaching out to community providers, as Beth mentioned early, 
working with PCPs, working with schools, working with OTs. And Margo asked some good questions around that, and she's doing some of this. I think people who are on kind of the front lines who could start providing some of this information for families and knowing what the guidelines are would be a way for us to ramp up. I think if we, if we keep it at the kind of model that I'm used to and actually very familiar with, which is a more medical model of families come into the clinic, they see me, they see a developmental pediatrician, at the same time address both behavioral issues and medical issues. It's a really effective model, but it might not be the most efficient model to get information out to families. And I think moving beyond that to people who are providing services to families in other capacities would be another way to do this. And maybe there can be, I think some of it will be trial and error and thinking about what works, but maybe some of that would be group presentations to providers to teach them what they need to know through webinars or bigger meetings together, and then providing the support they need to, create, to be able to provide the help and education to families. Great. Yeah, I think, yeah, this is Beth. I think those are excellent points, Terry. I wanted to add that I think that um, if we can figure out how to get information directly to the families mm -hmm. in a more comprehensive way than the pamphlet or a more interactive way, maybe through webinars or through um, an interactive app, something that they can do um, on their own, and then have the um, professionals that you just mentioned as coaches, potentially, yeah. where they can work specifically with the family after the family has digested some of um, the information. I think that would be another really exciting approach uh, to consider. I think it's a great idea. And I would just add, as we develop these models, to come up with some ways to measure outcome around it, too. Because again, my experience doing community presentations, that it all feels great and you're providing a lot of good information, but you don't know where it's all going and how helpful it is. So I think we want to keep that, the research component and outcome measure in mind as we right. as develop these ideas. Yeah. I think we've got a couple of other uh, questions from our audience there. Um, yeah. Margaret Souders, you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I uh, wanted to just thank uh, Terry and Kristen and Beth for a wonderful presentation. I, um, I have been able to conduct uh, four workshops with um, advanced practice nurses with different groups using uh, Beth Mallow and the Vanderbilt um, group manual. And then um, in two research studies, I was able to provide uh, 65 individual education sessions. So I feel like I've, I've gotten my feet wet about how to uh, present the APN Sleep Toolkit uh, to both group and individual. So I'm moving forward, and I guess I need advice. I am going to be presenting, we, we call it family cafes for uh, children at the Center for Autism. They are ages 3 to 5, and there's 90 of them. Um, they're all a minority uh, families. And we are going to unroll these uh, family cafes um, at this school uh, with advanced practice nurses. I, I think we can, we're going to meet in small, smaller groups, like 10 to 12 families at a time. I'll bring like six nurses with me. Um, but I don't know, how should we go about um, measuring outcome in a simple way? So I'll, I think I'm going to enroll this in a community setting in Philadelphia with 90, with an N of 90. But I, I don't know um, how we should go about uh, checking fidelity. Well, um, this is Beth. In terms of outcomes, I think, and we can talk about this more in our next call if people want to join, but um, I think outcomes that are important to the family, such as their level of satisfaction and how they feel it's changed their, um, their, you know, their, their family, their sleep habits, whatever, is very important. And equally important, I think, are um, some simple things that you can do to measure sleep. And it may be just going with a questionnaire or a diary is the most effective in a community setting rather than actigraphy, for example. Um, in terms of measuring Fidelity, um, Terry Katz actually has developed a really neat tool that we're using right now in another ATN ARP 
a study of iron and sleep, and I'm going to let Terry talk about that for a moment because it's really exciting. Oh, sure. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, it, it just might be something you'd be interested in, Margaret, and we can talk more about it for sure. But um, it's really a measure looking at how much parents have learned the kinds of strategies that we're trying to teach them. And we're, right now it's called the Parent Absorption Questionnaire. We've been thinking about maybe some other titles for that, but um, and we're piloting, as Beth said, through the Iron Sleep Study. But it's really just a matter of going through some of those sleep basics, you know, what are the, what's the importance of Day, you know, daytime habits affecting sleep, changes in bedtime routines, and not in a quiz format, but in a sense of just talking with parents about what they've learned, and then assessing how much they have um, learned those ideas and have, have in mind what we would consider sort of the basic information you need to develop a good um, sleep, a good set of sleep habits for your child. And it's pretty quick. It doesn't take a long time to complete. And it may be something that would help with um, your question around fidelity. Okay. Now, um, you know, in the Department of Defense grant that I have, I am going to be checking um, fidelity in 20 families. But it's, a two, it's two home visits. And um, we have uh, check-off sheets, and we've created steps for each one of the interventions in terms of the positive routines. And so mm -hmm. it would be, um, if you divide the steps into these are the steps you, you were suggested to do, of the steps, how many did you complete? And then every, so I, I can check fidelity, like going to the house, like I think that's a great, I, you know, what I'm doing. Um, but right. it's really hard to kind of just in a community setting without making it into an intervention. So like I, like in order for me to do the education, I have not put it through, like I haven't gotten an IRB. Um, it's not a research study. It's really education in a community for families in a school. And um, so I think I need your, I, I would like to see that uh, if you don't, don't mind sharing it. Um, oh, of course. Because it would be like a quick uh, follow-up in four weeks based on what the parents are saying. And is, right. there, is that quantitative? Like can you, do, do you put it into a like a, a Likert scale of some sort? Yeah. And you can also, it can be a quick phone call that you could do with families. So if, if you have the means to do that, absolutely. Yeah, so I, will, I could have the yeah I could have the nurses call so we can have an N and ninety. But the thinking is it's, it's I'm trying to do it not as a research study, um, mm -hmm. but it always turns out to be one. Like you, you know what I'm saying. So I feel like right now if I'm actually going to make a nurse call up, um, yeah. how would we write it up? Would I need an I or B? All those kind of things. Well, let me share that with you, and we can talk more about it too. But I okay. think it might really fit your needs very well. Great. We've got one more question I'd like to go to. Uh, Joni Bosch has a question or a couple of questions. Joni, are you still there? Can we unmute Joni? Yes, just give me one second. There we go. Joni, you should be unmuted. Yep, I heard her say that. So um, one was, have you gotten insurance coverage for uh, especially like maybe the one-hour personal uh, coverage of the, or discussion of sleep problems? That is a really good question. Um, and the answer is we did it in our research setting. This is a research study funded by the AARP, so we did not have to charge it to insurance. Um, but I do feel that needs to be explored. Some, you know, that was the point brought up earlier by Terry, is we can sometimes use behavioral analysts and other therapists to um, to impart the sleep education, and then they are able to bill at least in some states, not all, and for some diagnoses, not all. Um, but I think that's going to be really critical. Is how do we, as we talk about how we unroll this and how we uh, disseminate it, we have to be thinking, you know, how are we going to get this paid for too? Um, so you know, I think having a variety of of mechanisms to impart these. Um, these strategies and, and these programs will be very important. You know, I also kind of part two of this is, and, and looking at the website, there's a lot of written stuff. There's pictures. When you deal with parents, not everybody does well with reading. I've only ever been able to find one video online on helping parents with sleep problems, and that's a Super Nanny episode, The Wishmeyer. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> And I think a video would be really awesome. I mean, one of the nice things about that Super Nanny episode is it shows that kids running around the room screaming while the parents are going out there, you know, pulling their hair and wanting to go in and rescue them, and the Super Nanny saying no. It would be nice to have a video for parents who are not so hot with reading to, to show some of that stuff. So, I mean, if somebody could get a video up, frankly, I think that would be incredibly helpful for a lot of different people. You know, that's so great to hear. We, we actually put, put something together, and we're in the process of finalizing it using clips from our um, sleep education, um, particularly having our educators. Terry was one of our educators in our research project and how they um, interacted with families. So it's really helpful to hear that because it gives us the impetus to kind of get through, through the final uh, stages. Thank yeah. you. And again, if you can, you know, if there's a family that's having problems and you can get out there and actually videotape to show how incredibly stressful it is. Yeah. And that if they're not the only kids who, you know, who are bouncing off the wall and screaming, I think that people need to, you know, see some of that kind of difficulty too. Yes, thank you. Very good, folks. Very lively discussion today. Excellent questions and excellent uh, commentary by our speakers. I want to thank our speakers today, uh, Dr. Beth Mallow, Dr. Terry Katz, and Dr. Kristen Soule. And I want to thank everyone who uh, tuned in to today's webinar. We have run over a few moments, so I'm going to go ahead and let us all sign off now, but keep in touch. We'll have our next webinar next month.